it came to pass that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I am taken from thee. And Elisha said, Let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. to talk to you about something. I want to talk to you about facing trouble with faith. If you're new today, we're in a series on Elisha. We're in our third installment of the series. And honestly, I'm, I, in my notes, it says we come to a very interesting story with a lot of practical application. But can I just say, almost every story in his life is very interesting, very unique, and has a ton of practical application. What we're learning about is a God who does things in very unique ways in our life. And sometimes the reason why we need him to do that is because of the trouble that we've encountered in our life. When it comes to trouble, sometimes it comes from just the fact that we live in a sinful world. Some trouble is because we live in a sin-cursed world. Some trouble is because of the actions of other people towards us or, or as we're around them. And then sometimes some trouble is the result of choices we make. It's that third area that I want to talk to you about this morning because there's some of you and you're in trouble. And if you're honest, it's because of choices you made. If you could do it over again, you make a different choice. Hopefully you learned from a mistake. But what we see in 2 Kings chapter 3 is something that's incredible news. God helps us in the midst of trouble, even when the trouble we're in is our own fault. Some of you thought, well, I made a bad choice. I made the decision, now I'm suffering the consequences, so that's just where God wants me, and that's his will, and, and I can't even go to him and ask him to get me out of it because I made the trouble for myself. And the good news is we have a God who loves us so much, who delights to show himself powerful in our own lives, and he's a God who helps us in the midst of trouble. But we have to face that trouble with faith. So let's look at it. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. Joram, son of Ahab, Ahab, the most wicked king Israel had had up to the time, uh, almost more wicked than any king before or since, married to a woman named Jezebel who tried to kill Elijah. Joram, son of Ahab, became king in Israel of Israel and Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned 12 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father and mother had done. He got rid of the sacred stone of Baal, which was a fertility goddess worship with uh, male shrine prostitutes, female shrine prostitutes, all kinds of, of sensual worship. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit, and those sins are... Jeroboam, remember, made a golden calf, two of them. One he put in Bethel, one he put in Dan, to the northern part of the kingdom, the southern part of the kingdom, and told people, that's God, let's worship him, and instituted religious festivals similar to those uh, in, of, in Jerusalem so that the people would have a parallel way of serving God, and he said, these calves are God, and God hated it. Now Misha, king of Moab, raised sheep, and he had to supply the king of Israel with 100,000 lambs and with the wool of 100,000 rams. But after Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So at that time, Joram set out from Samaria and mobilized all of Israel. So essentially what you have is you have a wicked king who decides he's going to invade a country who was serving him, but now no longer is going to do that. And that sets the stage for what we're going to look at 
and the three lessons that come out of this story, amazing lessons, all of them regarding trouble. The first principle is this, hanging out with the wrong people will get you into trouble. Parents, I would just say this, you gotta pick your kids' friends and don't feel bad about doing it. There are some friends your children would do well to let go of. But adults, you gotta be careful about the friends that you have. Students, be careful about the friends that you have. College students, you're starting this year. Be careful about the friends that you pick. You say, well, I love God. I'm not worried about me. Oh, be careful. Paul said, bad company corrupts good morals. 1 Corinthians 15. Not in my notes. Write it down. So at that time, Joram set out from Samaria and he mobilized all Israel, and he sent this message to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, the southern kingdom. And Jehoshaphat was a good king. So here's a wicked king, and he's reaching out to a good king. And the reason why he's doing it is because he's related by marriage to this good king, which we're going to see how that all happened. In fact, we read this about Jehoshaphat. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because in his early years, he walked in the ways of his father David had followed. Very interesting, early years. Let me ask you this question. Are you as on fire for God today as you were 10 years ago or 15 years ago? Are you serving God with the same zeal? Are you loving God or are you more involved in in ministering in his name to people and helping and participating and active in the church than you were 15 years ago? Or along the way, did you pick up some friendships that have influenced you and left you less committed to the Lord than you were in your early years? Have you maybe gotten in a partnership and they don't love God and they don't believe in God. Maybe you say, well, they're not against God, but nonetheless, they're not interested in the things of God. And now what's happened is your interest in the things of God has diminished because of your relationship with them. It says he sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. He's a good king, but he goes into partnership with a king who does not love God and it affects his walk with God. Look at what happens. The king asked him to come, or the king said, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me and fight against Moab? And Jehoshaphat says, I'll go with you. And then he says the dumbest thing. Every time I read it, I roll my eyeballs. <laughs> I am as you are. No, you're not. My people are as your people. I hope they're not. And my horses are as your horses. You want to say, Jehoshaphat, what are you doing? You're going to get yourself in trouble. And he should already know this very, very well. Because if you know anything about the history of Jehoshaphat, you know he understands when you hang out with people who don't love God, it doesn't go well for you. If we go back, Joram's dad was Ahab. And if you can believe this, Jehoshaphat said the same thing to Ahab, and it almost cost him his life. Look at it in 1 Kings 22.2. But in the third year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, he went down to see the king of Israel. What in the world is he doing? You say, well, it's politics. He's got to, it's going to be good. You see, this is the thing. We can rationalize our relationships with people who don't know God. Well, if I don't, if I don't stay with him, who's going to care for me? How am I going to pay my rent unless I sleep with him? Well, you know, nobody's ever been as nice to me as she is. Or business people. You know what? I make a lot of money. I know it's not. I know, I know it's not 
they're not Christians, but they're good people, and I can make a lot of money. Oh, we can rationalize. We can find a reason, a rationale for every single time we want to do something that is less than God's will for us. Here he is. The king of Israel said to him, don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us and we are doing nothing to receive, to retake it from the king of Aram? So he asked Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight against Ramoth Gilead? Now get ready, look at your neighbor, roll your eyeballs, said, here he is, he's saying it again. Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I'm as you are. My people are as your people. My horses are as your horses. Verse 29 so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, listen to this, I can't believe Jehoshaphat is so obtuse. You say, what's that mean? Stupid. <laughs> I will enter the battle. This is what the king of Israel says. In disguise. But you wear your royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. What does that tell you? He doesn't care about Jehoshaphat. Now the king of Aram had ordered his 32 chariot commanders, don't fight with anyone small or great except the king of Israel. So when they saw Jehoshaphat, they thought, surely this is the king of Israel because they saw him in his royal robes. So they turned to attack him. But when Jehoshaphat cried out, the chariot commanders saw that he was not the king of Israel and they stopped pursuing him. It almost cost him his life. Interesting, isn't it? You hang out with the wrong crowd, and it becomes dangerous. Might be physically dangerous, might be emotionally dangerous, might be mentally dangerous. I've seen people hang out with the wrong crowd, and their, their thinking's mixed up. I've seen people hang out with the wrong crowd, and they're abused emotionally. They're, they're, there's an effect. I, I've seen people hang out with the wrong crowd, and it's physically harmful to them. More than that, watch what happens in his walk with God. Second Chronicles, when Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned safely to his palace in Jerusalem, Jehu the seer, the son of Hanani, went out to meet him and said to the king, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? I just want to ask you, should you really, should you really help wicked people? You say, well, I'm trying to reach him for Christ. We have a responsibility to reach people for Christ. I'm talking about intimate relationship. And should you love those who hate the Lord? Who are against the Lord? I don't believe in that stuff. I don't want any part of that. Don't push your religion on. Should you really be hanging? Is that the, are those the people you should be having close interaction with? Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Now, let me just say this, because we don't have time, but what happens to Jehoshaphat? He, he becomes friends with Ahab. They become family friends. Ahab's wife is Jezebel. What happens is Ahab and Jezebel have a daughter. Her name is Athaliah. And next thing you know, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, marries Athaliah. Athaliah is a carbon copy of her demonized mother. Can you imagine having somebody like that as your daughter-in-law? Now, he's brought that influence into his home. You see, what happens is you start hanging out with the wrong people, you're going to start bringing their influence in your home. You don't know how, you don't know where, but it's going to happen. And then guess what happens? Something, you see, a lot of times we're, we're too interested in what we can see with our eyes, not thinking for a minute about the future, not thinking for a minute about the consequences, not thinking for a minute about the ramifications, not thinking about our grandkids or even our children. She marries Jehoram. Jehoshaphat dies. Jehoram takes the throne. And you know what Jehoram does? He's a wicked king. So you know what he does? He kills all of his siblings wants no rivals to the throne. So Jehoshaphat, he hangs around with wicked people, and the result is all his kids but one are killed. Pretty terrible trade, isn't it? 
pretty fearful, pretty harmful ramification. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. So Jehoram and Athaliah have children. And when Jehoram dies, and he dies, he's so wicked, he dies quickly. And when he dies, his son reigns for a year. And when he dies, Athaliah kills all of their children. Can you imagine that this woman is a demonized, psychotic, sociopath, psychopath, who would kill their children? She does it so she could reign unopposed. You see, he hung out with the wrong crowd and it caused great harm. All because he hung out with fools. He is a living illustration of Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20. He who walks with the wise grows wise. You want to get wise? You say, I want to get wise? Get around wise people. You'd be surprised what you learn. I can remember in the early days pastoring James River, I would meet with a group of guys. They were wise. They were older than me. They would talk about parenting. I learned a whole lot from listening to them talk. You walk with the wise, you become wise. But... A companion, a friend of fools suffers harm. What is a fool? Let's talk about that for a moment. The Bible says this, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool is the person who says, oh, I don't believe in all that God stuff. Oh, I'm not sure there's a God. Oh, you know, that's all. Everybody has their own way, blah, 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 blah. That's the fool. Bible's not for me, you're a fool. True God's not for me, Jesus, all that stuff, you're a fool. Here's the thing about a fool. The fool is the person as well who knows the difference between right and wrong but doesn't care. So you're hanging out with him, you're like, that's not good to do, I don't care. Shouldn't do that, I don't care. That's against the law, I don't care. That's the fool. If you're around somebody and they're like, I don't care, whatever, they're a fool. And the companion of fools suffers harm. The fool is the person who says, I don't care about the things of God. I don't care about the word of God. I don't care about church. I don't care about worshiping God. I don't care about hanging out with godly people. I don't care about any of that. You're a fool. Some of you are dating a fool. You say, but she is so hot. Well, so is hell. But I mean, some of you are living together with a fool. Because you want, they don't want to get married to you. They're stringing you on. You tell them, you try to tell them principles of godliness. I don't care. I don't believe that. That's not for me. But you're afraid to leave them, and you've locked, you've tied your fate to a fool. And guess what? A companion of fools suffers harm. For some of you, your friends are fools. You know, you remember dating myself at the A team. Remember Mr. T? <laughs> Gold chains, mohawk. You fool. You know, he said that all the time. Some of you, are, you're dating fools. You're hanging out with fools. You're living with fools. You're surrounded by fools. And it's going to cause you harm. Proverbs 13, 20. A companion of fools suffers harm. Notice it doesn't say a companion of fools becomes a fool. It's very interesting. You walk with the wise, you become wise. You hang about with fools. It's not that you become a fool. It's just you're going you're gonna to get yourself in trouble. It's going to harm you. This is why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. Don't make them your close friends. Don't live with people that are unbelievers. You say, but I'm married. Then there's scriptural prescriptions for you in that situation. I'm talking about people who haven't tied the knot. 
Don't become a partner in business with somebody who doesn't know the Lord, who's an unbeliever. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? You're light, they're dark. So how's that going to work? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? That is such strong language, but Paul is doing it to get our attention. Don't do it. You're under grace, they're under wrath. You're serving God, they're serving the devil, whether they think they are or not. How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? Great question. You say, what do I do? Break it off, move out, in the partnership, find new friends. Now listen, for some of you, this is a straight word, but this is the word of God to you, and God brought you here today to hear it because God wants to save you from yourself. Back to 2 Kings. By what route shall we attack, he asked, through the desert of Edom, he answered. So the king, Joshua, is saying, how are we going to go about doing this? So listen, now he's going to listen to a fool. And the fool's going to say, well, I think we ought to go through the desert. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom after a roundabout march of seven days. The army had no more water for themselves or for the animals with them. See, foolish people make foolish decisions and then they blame God for them, though they say they don't believe in God, which is more foolishness. What, exclaimed the king of Israel, has the Lord called us three kings together only to hand us over to Moab? Why doesn't he blame himself? Why doesn't he blame the gods he serves? Why didn't he blame the golden calves? Why didn't he blame, but you see, that's the way it works. Ultimately, when people get in trouble, they know who God is, and then God's the one to blame, and they're only trying to justify the reason I, I never served him in the first place because he's, it, it just doesn't work. That's a fool. Trouble comes when we hang out with the wrong people. It's just true, 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 and true. Number two, worship is where you hear God's voice when you're in trouble. Why do you think Brandon got up here and stopped the service? Because I told him beforehand, if the people aren't worshiping, stop them and direct their focus because there is much at stake. I'm not, I'm not trying to whip people up into a frenzy. I'm trying to get people in a mindset where they can hear from God because there's some of you in trouble and God wants to talk to you. And the time and the place to go and talk to you is in worship. I mean, for some of you, you're in worship right now and you've already heard from God. You've heard more than you can. You're, you're, you're like, your arms are full. You're going out the door like this with the to-do list of things to do. <laughs> you've heard from God. Some of you are in trouble. You're facing difficulty. And here's the good news. When you and I are worshiping God, We'll hear from God. When we set our eyes on him and our heart on worshiping him, what happens? The Bible says that the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. He comes down in a place. He moves among people. So as you're worshiping the Lord, the reason why I want you to worship the Lord is because when you're worshiping the Lord, you're setting yourself up to hear from the Lord. If you're just watching and saying, I don't know why they have to work everybody up and how long before this is over, you're not hearing anything. And that's a tragedy. And if you don't care, I say this for love, but I say it for truth, you're a fool. And you ought to repent. You say, you sound so mean and harsh. Sometimes people need to hear it in a stronger way. I'm just saying. John the Baptist, the greatest prophet who ever lived, when people came out to him, how did he greet him? Oh, I'm so glad you've come to see me in the desert. Wrong. You brood of vipers. Who warned you to come out here? Sometimes we just got to hear it straight. 
And I'm, I'm going to cut it straight with you today because I'm really concerned. For the trouble you're in and the trouble you're going to be in. And I want you to hear from God. And I want you to turn from foolishness to the Lord. Because the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but it's in his death. Jehoshaphat's in trouble. And the first thing he says is, there not a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord through him? And an officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, Elisha son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Isn't that interesting? Elisha, led by God, I believe, to be there with a the word from God because God cares about the trouble people are in. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, what do we have to do with each other? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. Now, again, you know, God's vessels are human. That's not a very nice response, is it? I mean, you finally have a pagan king, a wicked king, saying, I, I, I want to come to the Lord. I mean, I want to, counsel, I want to seek counsel from the Lord. And Elisha's like, <laughs> you, think, you think I even have any time for you? I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even look at you. I wouldn't talk to you. I wouldn't have anything to do with you if it weren't for Jehoshaphat. And you say, what's up with that? How's God going to use a guy like that? It's a very interesting thing to consider. I maybe shouldn't have brought it up because you might not have thought of it. But I want you to see God uses imperfect people, and for all of us, that works to our advantage. It's not an excuse. It's not saying it's okay. It's simply saying it's the reality. And if you're looking for the perfect person or you think you found them, you just don't know them. So here he is, and Elisha said, As surely as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you. I wouldn't even notice you. And then he says, but now bring a harp. You know what he understands? I think he realizes I'm not in a place, having said that, that I can hear from God. I got I to gotta get myself under control. I got to say, Lord, oh, that guy irritates me. But I need to hear from you, and I know I can't hear from you at all because I'm all worked up about him, and I said things I shouldn't have said. God, you know. I mean, he's going through. They're human. Give me a harpist. Let's play. Where's Eli and Don? Have him sing again. While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came on him. Isn't that interesting? You see, there's something about while there's worship going on and the Lord comes down, he's not only talking to you, but in many instances, his hand comes on you. This is why, I'm just, I throw this out, this is free. When you're late, you lose. I mean, you get part of it, but you don't get all of it. It's like you get a half a loaf when you get out a whole loaf. It's like having a half a hamburger. I mean, what is half a hamburger? Debbie at times will say, let's split it. I'm like, what's left? Two bites? I mean, I mean, a half a hamburger. What's a half a hamburger? I, I, I mean, how many people would say, yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I'm not a half a hamburger guy. Don't ever do that to me. That's nothing. That just like makes you hungry. You're like, I'm going to go order another one. Um, just teasing, kind of. Okay. And he said, this is what the Lord says. And all of a sudden, he has a word from the Lord that to the natural ear and the natural mind sounds crazy. But the Lord spoke. God speaks in worship. And 
Let me just say this to you, that in your own personal time with the Lord, a good thing to do is to have a pencil and a piece of paper, a pen and a piece of paper, because God's going to talk to you, and he's going to talk to you about things maybe you weren't even talking to him about. He's going to talk to you about things you need to know about. He's going to speak to you, and that way you don't stop and get caught up in thinking about, well, why am I thinking about that? Just write it down, keep on going, keep on spending time with the Lord, because God talks to us in worship. Worship is where you hear God's voice. Number three. Faith and obedience bring God's help for trouble. Faith and obedience. The two go together. Their problem is that there are three armies. Standed, they're stranded in the desert. They have no water for their armies. They have no water for their animals. Here's God's solution. Check this out. While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came on Elisha, and he said, this is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches, for this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water. You and your cattle and your other animals will drink. Okay, stop just a minute. We're going to dig ditches. We're going to dig ditches all day. We're already thirsty. We're already tired. We're already worn out, and we're not going to see a drop of rain, and we're not even going to have a sign that there's a wind somewhere bringing in a storm front. But the ditches are going to be full of water. How is that possible? It's an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. Listen, just because you can't figure it out, just because it doesn't make sense, just because you don't understand how it's going to work, doesn't matter. It might be hard to you. It might not make sense to you. It might be impossible to you. But can you understand that anything is easy in the eyes of the Lord? He can do anything. And he'll also hand Moab over to you. You know what makes sense? God's saying, hey, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you, see that point right there? I'm going to have you dig, and there will be a well there. And you'll water your people. You'll water the animals and the flock. You know what can happen is they face a choice right there. Are they going to debate the logic and what God has asked them to do? Or are they by faith and in obedience going to start digging ditches? Right now, many of you are in a situation, and this is the issue in front of you. Are you going to debate God's logic? Are you going to argue based on your own reasoning what you think, or are you going to say, you know what, I'm going to dig ditches. I'm going to start doing what he says to do. Let me just give you several examples. I'm going to start with one that probably hits close to home for some people, and that's the whole issue of tithing. A tithe is 10% of your income. The Bible says over and over, the tithe belongs to the Lord. It's reaffirmed in the New Testament. Jesus said, this you should have done without neglecting justice and mercy. So Jesus reaffirmed the tithe. So 10% belongs to the Lord. God says, if you give him 10% of your income and you give it first, you don't pay all the bills and then give it. No, you in faith give it first, and then you find you... He helps you pay all the bills. If you wait until the bills are all paid before you tithe, you might not ever tithe, especially if you've never tithed. To, but what happens is people say, well, I don't understand that. Okay, that's the first problem. You're going to go off your understanding, and you're going to say, I don't make any sense. Well, it's an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. You may not understand. It's an easy thing for him to do. That's why every week we have all these stories and we, that's not the only story we get that week. We have lots of stories on how people are blessed, and we share them with you to encourage you, to cause you to think, oh, hey, wait a minute. It's happening for them, 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 them. It's all around you, and you're seeing God provide all around you. The question is, will you step out in faith and obedience? And even though you can't understand how if you give away 10%, you'll do more, God will do more in you, through you, and bless you in a way that the 90% will be more than the 100% was. So for some of you, honestly, you're going to have to dig a ditch. 
In faith, you're going to have to say, I'm going to dig a ditch. I'm going to write a check. I'm going to go on, I'm going to go on the website. I'm going to go on, my, on the app. I'm going, to, I'm going to go out to one of the giving boxes, and I'm going to write a tight check. I'm going to dig a ditch. I'm going to write a check. Some of you, you're raising kids. You're concerned about your kids. You want godly kids. You're going to have to dig a ditch. You have to get your kids to church on Wednesday night. Just tell you, I mean, Sunday's great, but Wednesday night, your, your children need social interaction with other believers in the presence of God in a way that will change their life. You're going to have to dig a ditch. And instead of going to the grocery store or going out to dinner while your kids are here, no, you're going to dig a ditch right on into the prayer meeting. You're going to dig a ditch. You're going to, by faith and obedience, dig a ditch because if you tell your kids it's good for you, but I don't need it, you're a hypocrite and they'll reject you. Listen, the thing that causes kids to rebel is hypocrisy in parents who say one thing and do another. And kids can smell that from a mile away. So if it's good for them to be in church, and it is, it's good for you to be in church, and it is. You're going to have to dig a ditch. If you want a strong marriage, you're going to have to dig a ditch. Some of you are going to need to pick up the phone and call a counselor because you've let things build up to such a degree, it's going to take somebody to help you to resolve it. You're going to have to dig a ditch. If you've got a life-controlling problem, you need to go to living free. It helps people with all kinds, emotional controlling problems, substance controlling problems, sexual controlling, life controlling problems. You're going to need to dig a ditch. That means you're going to have to be bold enough to say, you know what? I got a problem. If the king sit in the desert, here's what you're doing. You got, you got substance abuse issues or you got sexual issues or you got emotional issues and you're saying, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I've, I know I got a problem, but I don't, nobody knows about it, so it's not really a problem. Listen, if the kings sit in the desert and do that, they're all going to die. It's going to happen to you. You're going to have to dig a ditch. If, if you want friends, you want to get around godly people. I don't know. You talk about getting around godly people, John. I don't know where I'd start. Oh, have I got news for you. In fact, God put a brochure right at your seat. It's called Life Groups. You're going to have to dig a ditch. You're going to have to scan that little code. You're going to have to say, I want to get in a life group, and our life group department will will connect you. Dig a ditch. Go to a life group. You say, oh, I tried it. It didn't work. Dig another ditch. Go to it. Listen, fill the valley with ditches. Not one ditch. Ditches. Dig as many as you have to till the water starts to flow. That's what the Lord said. He said, I just don't know how to get involved in the church. Dig a ditch. Get in grow track. I don't know what my gifts are. Dig a ditch. Get in grow track. You say, I, I need to be healed. Dig a ditch and get down to the front where people can pray for you. Somebody said, well, I just wish God would heal me at my seat. Well, you know what? Dig a ditch. If anyone's sick among you, he should call for the elders of the church. They should anoint him with oil. And the prayer offered in faith will heal the sick person. The Lord will raise him up. You're going to have to dig a ditch. You're going to have to come forward. You say, but I came forward last week. Dig a ditch again. Come and come and come till you're healed. It's a matter of faith and obedience. Let me just add, digging ditches is hard work. And they're thirsty and they're digging. And some of you are thirsty and you're dry and you're tired. That's not the time to sit down. That's the time to dig a ditch. Think of it. If Jehoshaphat and the two other kings... Sit there and discuss whether this makes sense. They not only will have missed the opportunity, but the next day, the armies of Moab will overrun them and slaughter them. There's more at stake than you and I realize. The next morning about that time, for the offering, the sacrifice, there was water flowing from the direction of Edom. Isn't that interesting? Where did it come from? And the land was filled with water. And you know what happened? They, were, they thought they were digging ditches so they could drink water. But God had them digging ditches so he could fill it with water so that the enemy would be fooled. In verse 22, 
And when they got up early in the morning, the sun was shining on the water, and to the Moabites across the way, the water looked red like blood. That's blood, they said. Those kings must have fought and slaughtered each other. Now to the plunder Moab. But when the Moabites came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up, fought them until they fled, and the Israelites invaded the land and slaughtered the Moabites. What brought the victory? God did. What was their responsibility? Faith and obedience. What will bring the victory in your life? God will. What, will. what will be the key to that? Faith and obedience on your part. And listen, these two, two of the kings were no paragon of virtue. They were, honestly, the whole group. It's two wicked kings, one backslidden king, but they believed God and obeyed God, and God blessed them. So wrap this up, let me just ask, are you hanging out with the wrong people? You say, oh no, you're back to that again. <laughs> Listen, if they don't love God with all their heart, you need to find some new people to hang out with. Are you hearing God's voice? God's voice is often heard in times of worship, and that's when we hear, honestly, I think it's when we hear his voice the clearest. It's when his hand comes upon us. And are you willing to walk in faith and obedience? Are you willing to say, God, I don't care if it makes sense to me. I'm just going to do it. God, I can't understand how I can forgive that person, but I'm just going to do it and ask you to help me to remove the bitterness from my heart. It might bring about your healing like that one lady from California. Maybe you have to dig a ditch of forgiveness. What is God asking you to do? And will you believe that there's nothing you and I do for the Lord that he does not honor in our lives? Faith digs ditches. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.